everybody welcome to the wine with jimmy channel here on the world of youtube this is an educational channel all things about the world of wine to help you get more from it and just enjoy it better so this is a series on my channel called explaining wine terminology we have a certain topic and we talk to you about it, giving you the information you need to understand. If you have any comments or questions or concerns, please pop them in the comments section below this video on YouTube. You can also click subscribe to get our weekly updates and also the like button because every little helps. So on this video, now, you may have seen on the label, contains sulfites. So we're going to talk about the world of sulfur used in wine making. So this is basically the world of sulfur dioxide uh, and how applicable it is in terms of that sulfite you find on the label, because it can be a little bit misleading. There, are, there seems to be no other ingredients normally on most bottles of wine, apart from something saying sulfite. So it's what gets talked about. I mean, it doesn't even say that it contains grapes on a lot of the uh, labels, apart from the South Africans, of course. So it is a strange one, but it is a legally defined area. So that's what we're going to go through in this presentation. So first of all, the world of sulfur dioxide used for winemaking. Now, what is it? So, sulfur dioxide, or SO2, it may be written, is an inorganic compound and a heavy, colourless, poisonous gas formed by burning sulfur in air. So that's where you get the sulfur and the oxide part. Sulfur dioxide has quite a, a pungent, irritating odour, which is familiar to the same smell of a struck match. So very similar to that. Um, the upper levels of sulfur dioxide in wine are strictly controlled as it can be toxic, hence why we have lots of labelling around it. Uh, but it's important to know that the numbers that are found in wine are actually considerably lower than other food stuffs. So you'll see the chart on the left hand side. If you go to a supermarket and buy, I don't know, a packet of dried apricots, you're looking at considerably more volumes of sulfur in that pack. That means, of course, it's going to have more of an effect on you if it does have an effect. And French fries, frozen juices, prepared meals, packaged meats, soda, you know, they all have a significant more amount than, say, red wines down here, commercial wines down here as well. So very important to understand that uh, because, of course, a lot of people, there are people that are huge advocates for um, the the problems with wine because of sulfur, uh, but there are other products in the world that have certainly have a lot more than uh, than wine. Um, so why is this all important? Well, it can actually cause um, allergic reactions even at lower levels, and it's potentially the most problematic for people with respiratory problems such as asthma. But it will affect people in different ways depending on who you are, but mainly asthmatics tend to get the, the, the most effect from it. So um, let's just talk a bit about that because sulfur has said, has said to have been the cause that will give adverse reactions uh, in some wine drinkers. But this is being widely proven as a bit of a myth in modern science today. There was a current research paper released by Sophie Parker Thompson arguing that bottlings made without added sulfites might actually be more apt to generate symptoms like headaches and also things like watery eyes. Why? Well, instead of sulfites, Parker Thompson explained that the culprit is more likely to be a group of compounds called biogenic e uh, amines, or BA, biogenic amines. 
Now, LAB, which is lactic acid bacteria, sometimes make these biogenic amines, uh, the histamine, uh, ethylamine, amongst others. And the production depends on the strain, and they are a health concern to many consumers with symptoms ranging from things like nausea to hot flashes or to headaches. Uh, and that means, of course, with the the less use of sulfur or no added sulfur within the wine making side of it means that these are able to exist more so in fact reducing sulfur could be a way of increasing the potential uh, for headaches in consumers and also wines that tend to have higher ph levels so these are often places uh, wines from very warm climates for example uh, maybe hitting around sort of four on the pH scale. Um, often things like Grenache Serra blends could be like this in the south of France, tend to be um, wine styles, which will be potentially higher in these biogenic amines. Okay, so I thought I'd throw that in there because that's quite interesting. It might put a spanner in the works for you for what you may believe previously. Another thing to immediately mention as well is that there are no wines which are sulfur free. It does not exist. And please don't let anybody tell you that it can exist. Please don't let anybody tell you that there are certain machines or processes out there which will take sulfur away from wine. Sulfur dioxide is produced via fermentation, um, often around or just below 10 milligrams per litre. Uh, during fermentation. So this is important to note. It, it is produced naturally and then um, really it's said to be produced naturally as it is um, a naturally occurring thing that protects the wine. And then we've found that out and we've added more amounts into wine to actually protect the wine through the process. So small but wonderfully placed amounts of sulfur dioxide during the wine making process can make all the difference in terms of protecting the wine uh, as it is prepared and as it goes to market. A uh, little bit on labeling just here. So if a wine does contain over 10 milligrams uh, per liter of sulfur dioxide, it must contain it on the label. So there you are, so contain sulfites is what we find at the bottom of that label. So why? Why are we using it in winemaking? Well, sulfur dioxide can be applied in various forms. So it can be applied, applied as a gas, liquid or solid. Uh, so as sulfur dioxide, but maybe as potassium metabisulfite or potassium bisulfate. Uh, and it has the following properties. First of all, as an antioxidant. Sulfur dioxide, dioxide only reacts with oxygen itself very, very slowly. It reduces the effects of oxidation by reacting with the products of oxidative reactions so that they cannot oxidize further compounds in the wine. So that's important. It protects the wine against oxygen. And also here, it's an antimicrobial. So it inhibits the development of microbes such as yeast and bacteria. Different species of yeast and bacteria can vary in their tolerance to sulfur dioxide. The major yeast strain used for the production of wine, which is Saccharomyces, has quite good tolerance to it. Others may not. But really, it is creating a protective environment which will therefore stop things like re-fermentation and bacterial spoilage. Um, now, as mentioned, some sulfur dioxide is produced naturally in all wine fermentations. And most winemakers agree that keeping additions of sulfur dioxide as low as possible is the most preferable. If the levels are too high, the wine can seem harsh and lacking in fruit. Let's just quickly mention though um, the legislation around it. So this is just a little bit here. Um, maximum concentrations of sulfur dioxide are defined by local laws uh, and that's because remember we mentioned earlier that it's a toxic substance at the higher levels. Uh, so in the European Union 160 milligrams per litre of sulfur dioxide is the maximum permitted for red wines 
and 210 grams, uh, milligrams per litre is maximum permitted for white wines. I know it reads different here, but this is actually for organic wine production, which are different levels. Sweet wines are often permitted to contain higher levels. Uh, and the maximum permitted sulfur dioxide levels for uh, organic are lower. Um, and that's what we see here. So remember, I mentioned that red wine in Europe is 160. Here it's 100. And white wine is 210. Uh, but for organic white wine in Europe, it is 150. In the US of A, it's actually forbidden uh, for sulfur to be used for organic production. Uh, and other limits are very similar to Europe across the world in places like New Zealand, uh, not too different in Australia, a little bit stricter in places like Chile and Argentina, for example. Okay, now the producers of natural wines may choose not to add any sulfur dioxide or they use a very minor amount. Uh, good winery hygiene, effective grape sorting, and health of grapes can limit the timings and the amounts that you'll have to use of sulfur dioxide. Uh, so there are other things that can be done to restrict the volume of sulfur being used. Now, some terminologies for you. Sulfur dioxide is ge uh, generally added soon after the grapes are picked and or reach the winery. It then may be added at various points during the winemaking process and then finally at bottling. I'm going to go through that in a bit greater detail very shortly. When sulfur dioxide is added to a must or a wine, uh, it dissolves and it reacts with some of the components in the liquid. Uh, this proportion is actually what we call bound sulfur dioxide. And this is why I've put it behind bars on this slide. It is ineffective against oxidation and microbial effects. Uh, and in effect, if you do add it at the must stage or you add it at the wine stage, it's generally going to be lost uh, to the winemaker. So it's almost pointless to do so. And that's what we call bound sulfur dioxide. But it's the free sulfur dioxide, which is important. So the, the proportion that is not bound is called sulfur dioxide. The vast majority of free sulfur dioxide ex ex exists in a relatively inactive form and a small proportion exists as molecular sulfur dioxide, which is in fact the most effective against oxidation and microbial attack. So that's what we are really looking as the key sulfur in terms of protection of the wine. Just a little bit mentioned here about the pH level of the wine and the percentage of molecular sulfur dioxide you find. So here on the left hand side you have the pH level and then you have the percentage of molecular sulfur dioxide on the right hand side. So this is important because um, really at the lower pH levels, therefore a more stronger strength of acidity in the wine, you will find that the percentage of molecular free sulfur is in fact higher. Uh, most wines um, in say Northern Europe will sit at around three, 3.1, 3.2. Uh, so you'll see quite strong uh, um, uh, percentages here of sulfur dioxide uh, but if you go down to 3.5 3.6 you'll see that it drops dramatically um, also the sulfur dioxide actually works better at the lower pHs as well so there's a bigger percentage of it but it actually works better so in fact low pH wines are naturally much better at protecting themselves due to the free sulfur so low pH wines will not need requirements uh, uh, for as much sulfur being added uh, as others will need due to the percentage of free sulfur in the wine. Okay, let's uh, talk a little bit about when to add sulfur during the winemaking process. So the timing and size, so the amount of sulfur dioxide additions also influence the effectiveness 
of the added sulfur dioxide. So there are strategic additions. So adding a larger amount when the grapes are crushed, so really when the juice is first liberated, at the end of malolactic conversion, because that's when microbial intensity is at its highest, and then at bottling, because that's of course your last point of contact before it goes to market, usually. These tend to be the three times when the additions of sulfur are the most important, okay? But others may believe in other timings as well. Now, the, uh, the judici ju judicious additions of sulfur dioxide are beneficial and often necessary to produce unfaulty wines that remain unfaulty once packaged. It's important for that wine health. However, where possible, quality conscious winemakers will aim to limit the additions of sulfur dioxide, both because of legal restrictions that we went through earlier, but also because high levels of sulfur dioxide can dull aromas and flavors within a wine, and sometimes, in fact, cause the wine to taste harsh, potentially causing reductive volatile sulfur compounds, uh, for example. Um, and as mentioned earlier, really good winery hygiene, effective grape sorting, and also uh, really being very um, uh, quality conscious within your uh, production is a way of protecting your grapes. Uh, so things like limiting oxygen exposure, for example, may be a very, very useful tool here in protecting your grapes. So there we are. I hope this has given you plenty of information about the world of sulfur dioxide in winemaking. There's a whole other world of sulfur being used in the uh, vineyard as well. Uh, I'll cover that in a future um, a future presentation. But this is important to talk about and hopefully it's giving you something to think about in terms of what it actually means when you see contained sulfites on the label. Okay, so if you do have any comments, questions or concerns, remember you can get in touch with me here by commenting on this video below. Do you drink wines and have a reaction to any styles of wines? Have you found that red wines give you more headaches or is it white wines that give you more headaches? Please put your comments in the comment section below. Make sure you click subscribe and also like. If you would like to learn more about the world of wine and you are perhaps studying wine, then please come and have a look at my e-learning portal. That's www.winewithjimmy.com. And here you'll find loads and loads of video content, uh, revision sessions, multiple choice questions, uh, all those kind of things to help you with your studies of wine, specifically designed to be aimed at the WSET students of the world. Thank you so much for your time. And if you do find yourself in London, come and see me. Come and see me for a class, a glass or a bottle. I've been Jimmy Smith. Ciao for now.